The Science of Getting Rich, Part 2. Chapter 8, Thinking in a Certain Way. You must form a clear and definite mental picture of what you want. You cannot transmit an idea unless you have it yourself. You must have it before you can give it, and many people fail to impress thinking substance because they have themselves only a vague and misty concept of the things they want to do, to have, or to become. It is not enough that you should have a general desire for wealth to do good with. Everybody has that desire. It is not enough that you should have a wish to travel, see things, live more, etc. Everybody has those desires also. If you were going to send a wireless message to a friend, you would not send the letters of the alphabet in their order and let him construct the message for himself, nor would you take words at random from the dictionary. You would send a coherent sentence, one which meant something. When you try to impress your wants upon substance, remember that it must be done by a coherent statement. You must know what you want and be definite. You can never get rich or start the creative power into action by sending out unformed longings and vague desires. Go over your desires, just as the man I have described went over his house. See just what you want and get a clear mental picture of it as you wish it to look when you get it. That clear mental picture you must have continually in mind, as the sailor has in mind the port towards which he is sailing the ship, you must keep your face towards it all the time. You must no more lose sight of it than the steersman loses sight of the compass. It is not necessary to take exercises in concentration, nor to set apart special times for prayer and affirmation, nor to go into the silence, nor to do occult stunts of any kind. There things are well enough, but all you need is to know what you want, and to want it badly enough so that it will stay in your thoughts. Spend as much of your leisure time as you can in contemplating your picture, but no one needs to take exercises to concentrate his mind on a thing which he really wants. It is the things you do not really care about which require effort to fix your attention upon them. And unless you really want to get rich so that the desire is strong enough to hold your thoughts directly to the purpose as the magnetic pole holds the needle of the compass, it will hardly be worthwhile for you to try to carry out the instructions given in this book. The methods herein set forth are for people whose desire for riches is strong enough to overcome mental laziness and the love of ease and make them work. The more clear and definite you make your pictures then, and the more you dwell upon it, bringing out all of its delightful details, the stronger your desire will be, and the stronger your desire, the easier it will be to hold your mind fixed upon the picture of what you want. Something more is necessary, however, than merely to see the picture clearly. If that is all you do, you are only a dreamer, and will have little or no power for accomplishment. Behind your clear vision must be the purpose to realize it, to bring it out in tangible expression. And behind this purpose must be an invincible and unwavering faith that the thing is already yours, that it is at hand, and you have only to take possession of it. Live in the new house mentally until it takes form around you physically. In the mental realm, enter at once into full enjoyment of the things you want. Whatsoever things ye ask for when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them, said Jesus. See the things you want as if they were actually around you all the time. See yourself as owning and using them. Make use of them in imagination, just as you will use them when they are your tangible possessions. Dwell upon your mental picture until it is clear and distinct, and then take the mental attitude of ownership towards everything in that picture. Take possession of it in mind, in the full faith that it is actually yours. Hold to this mental ownership. Do not wave for an instant in the faith that it is real. And remember what was said in the preceding chapter about gratitude. Be as thankful for it all the time as you expect to be when it has taken form. The man who can sincerely thank God for the things which as yet he owns only in imagination has real faith. He will get rich. He will cause the creation of whatsoever he wants. You do not need to pray repeatedly for things you want. It is not necessary to tell God about it every day. Use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, said Jesus to his pupils. For your father knoweth that ye have need of these things before ye ask him. 
Your part is to intelligently formulate your desires for the things which make for a larger life, and to get these desires arranged into a coherent whole, and then to impress this whole desire upon the formless substance, which has the power and the will to bring you what you want. You do not make this impression by repeating strings of words. You make it by holding the vision with unshakable purpose to attain it, and with steadfast faith that you do attain it. The answer to your prayer is not according to your faith while you are talking, but according to your faith while you are working. You cannot impress the mind of God by having a special Sabbath day set apart to tell him what you want, and then forgetting him during the rest of the week. You cannot impress him by having special hours to go into your closet and pray, if you then dismiss the matter from your mind until the hour of prayer comes again. Oral prayer is well enough, and has its effect, especially upon yourself, in clarifying your vision and strengthening your faith. But it is not your oral petitions which get you what you want. In order to get rich, you do not need a sweet hour of prayer. You need to pray without ceasing. And by prayer, I mean holding steadily to your vision, with the purpose to cause its creation into solid form, and the faith that you are doing so. Believe that ye receive them. The whole matter turns on receiving, once you have clearly formed your vision. When you have formed it, it is well to make an oral statement, addressing the supreme and reverent prayer, and from that moment you must, in mind, receive what you ask for. Live in the new house, wear the fine clothes, ride in the automobile, go on the journey, and confidently plan for greater journeys. Think and speak of all things you have asked for in terms of actual present ownership. Imagine an environment and a financial condition exactly as you want them, and live all the time in that imaginary environment and financial condition. Mind, however, that you do not do this as a mere dreamer and castle builder. Hold to the faith that the imaginary is being realized, and to the purpose to realize it. Remember that it is faith and purpose in the use of imagination which makes the difference between the scientist and the dreamer. And having learned this fact, it is here that you must learn the proper use of the will. Chapter 9. How to Use the Will To set about getting rich in a scientific way, you do not try to apply your willpower to anything outside of yourself. You have no right to do so anyway. It is wrong to apply your will to other men and women in order to get them to do what you wish done. It is as flagrantly wrong to coerce people by mental power as it is to coerce them by physical power. If compelling people by physical force to do things for you reduces them to slavery, compelling them by mental means accomplishes exactly the same thing. The only difference is in methods. If taking things from people by physical force is robbery, then taking things by mental force is robbery also. There is no difference in principle. You have no right to use your willpower upon another person, even for his own good, for you do not know what is for his good. The science of getting rich does not require you to apply power or force to any other person in any way whatsoever. There is not the slightest necessity for doing so. Indeed, any attempt to use your will upon others will only tend to defeat your purpose. You do not need to apply your will to things in order to compel them to come to you. That would simply be trying to coerce God and would be foolish and useless as well as irreverent. You do not have to compel God to give you good things any more than you have to use your willpower to make the sun rise. You do not have to use your willpower to conquer an unfriendly deity or to make stubborn and rebellious forces do your bidding. Substance is friendly to you and is more anxious to give you what you want than you are to get it. To get rich, you need only to use your willpower upon yourself. When you know what to think and do, then you must use your will to compel yourself to think and do the right things. That is the legitimate use of the will in getting what you want, to use it in holding yourself to the right course. Use your will to keep yourself thinking and acting in the certain way. Do not try to project your will or thoughts or your mind out into space to act on things or people. Keep your mind at home. It can accomplish more there than elsewhere. Use your mind to form a mental image of what you want and to hold that vision with faith and purpose and use your will to keep your mind working in the right way. The more steady and continuous your faith and purpose, the more rapidly you will get rich 
because you will make only positive impressions upon substance, and you will not neutralize or offset them by negative impressions. The picture of your desires, held with faith and purpose, is taken up by the formless and permeates it to great distances throughout the universe, for all I know. As this impression spreads, all things are set moving towards its realizations. Every living thing, every inanimate thing, and the things yet uncreated are stirred towards bringing into being that which you want. All forces begin to be exerted in that direction. All things begin to move towards you. The minds of people everywhere are influenced towards doing the things necessary to the fulfilling of your desires, and they work for you unconsciously. But you can check all this by starting a negative impression in the formless substance. Doubt or unbelief is as certain to start a movement away from you as faith and purpose are to start one towards you. It is by not understanding this that most people who try to make use of mental science in getting rich make their failure. Every hour and moment you spend in giving heeds to doubts and fears. Every hour you spend in worry, every hour in which your soul is possessed by unbelief, sets a current away from you in the whole domain of intelligent substance. All the promises are unto them that believe, and unto them only. Notice how insistent Jesus was upon this point of belief, and now you know the reason why. Since belief is all important, it behooves you to guard your thoughts, and as your beliefs will be shaped to a very great extent by the things you observe and think about, it is important that you should command your attention. And here the will comes into use, for it is by your will that you determine upon what things your attention shall be fixed. If you want to become rich, you must not make a study of poverty. Things are not brought into being by thinking about their opposites. Health is never to be attained by studying disease and thinking about disease. Righteousness is not to be promoted by studying sin and thinking about sin. And no one ever got rich by studying poverty and thinking about poverty. Medicine as a science of disease has increased disease. Religion as a science of sin has promoted sin. And economics as a study of poverty will fill the world with wretchedness and want. Do not talk about poverty. Do not investigate it or concern yourself with it. Never mind what its causes are, you have nothing to do with them. What concerns you is the cure. Do not spend your time in charitable work or charity movements. All charity only tends to perpetuate the wretchedness it aims to eradicate. I do not say that you should be hard-hearted or unkind and refuse to hear the cry of need, but you must not try to eradicate poverty in any of the conventional ways. Put poverty behind you and put all that pertains to it behind you and make good. Get rich. That is the best way you can help the poor. And you cannot hold the mental image which is to make you rich if you fill your mind with pictures of poverty. Do not read books or papers which give circumstantial accounts of the wretchedness of the tenement dwellers, of the horrors of child labor, and so on. Do not read anything which fills your mind with gloomy images of want and suffering. You cannot help the poor in the least by knowing about these things, and the widespread knowledge of them does not tend at all to do away with poverty. What tends to do away with poverty is not getting the pictures of poverty into your mind, but getting pictures of wealth into the minds of the poor. You are not deserting the poor in their misery when you refuse to allow your mind to be filled with pictures of that misery. Poverty can be done away with, not by increasing the number of well-to-do people who think about poverty, but by increasing the number of poor people who purpose with faith to get rich. The poor do not need charity, they need inspiration. Charity only sends them a loaf of bread to keep them alive in their wretchedness, or give them an entertainment to make them forget for an hour or two. But inspiration will cause them to rise out of their misery. If you want to help the poor, demonstrate to them that they can become rich. Prove it by getting rich yourself. The only way in which poverty will ever be banished from this world is by getting a large and constantly increasing number of people to practice the teachings of this book. People must be taught to become rich by creation, not by competition. Every man who becomes rich by competition throws down behind him the ladder by which he rises and keeps others down. But every man who gets rich by creation opens a way for thousands to follow him and inspires them to do so. You are not showing hardness of heart or an unfeeling disposition when you refuse to pity poverty, see poverty, read about poverty, or think or talk about it, or to listen to those who do talk about it. 
use your willpower to keep your mind off the subject of poverty and to keep it fixed with faith and purpose on the vision of what you want. Chapter 10. Further Use of the Will You cannot retain a true and clear vision of wealth if you are constantly turning your attention to opposing pictures, whether they be external or imaginary. Do not tell of your past troubles of a financial nature, if you have had them. Do not think of them at all. Do not tell of the poverty of your parents or the hardships of your early life. To do any of these things is to mentally class yourself with the poor for the time being, and it will certainly check the movement of things in your direction. Let the dead bury their dead, as Jesus said. Put poverty and all things that pertain to poverty completely behind you. You have accepted a certain theory of the universe as being correct, and are resting all your hopes of happiness on its being correct. And what can you gain by giving heed to conflicting theories? Do not read religious books which tell you that the world is soon coming to an end, and do not read the writing of muckrakers and pessimistic philosophers who tell you that it is going to the devil. The world is not going to the devil. It is going to God. It is wonderful becoming. True, there may be a good many things in existing conditions which are disagreeable, but what is the use of studying them when they are certainly passing away, and when the study of them only tends to check their passing and keep them with us? Why give time and attention to things which are being removed by evolutionary growth, when you can hasten their removal only by promoting the evolutionary growth as far as your part of it goes? No matter how horrible and seeming may be the conditions in certain countries, sections, or places, you waste your time and destroy your own chances by considering them. You should interest yourself in the world's becoming rich. Think of the riches in the world as coming to, instead of the poverty it is growing out of. And bear in mind that the only way in which you can assist the world in growing rich is by growing rich yourself through creative method, not the competitive one. Give your attention wholly to riches. Ignore poverty. Whenever you think or speak of those who are poor, think and speak of them as those who are becoming rich, as those who are to be congratulated rather than pitied. Then they and others will catch the inspiration and begin to search for the way out. Because I say that you are to give your whole time and mind and thought to riches, it does not follow that you are to be sordid or mean. To become really rich is the noblest aim you can have in life, for it includes everything else. On the competitive plane, the struggle to get rich is a godless scramble for power over other men. But when we come into the creative mind, all this is changed. All that is possible in the way of greatness and soul unfoldment of service and lofty endeavor, comes by way of getting rich. All is made possible by the use of things. If you lack for physical health, you will find that the attainment of it is conditional on you getting rich. Only those who are emancipated from financial worry and who have the means to live a carefree existence and follow hygienic practices can have and retain health. Moral and spiritual greatness is possible only to those who are above the competitive battle for existence and only those who are becoming rich on the plane of creative thought are free from the degrading influences of competition. If your heart is set on domestic happiness, remember that love flourishes best when there is refinement, a high level of thought, and freedom from corrupting influences. And these are to be found only where riches are attained by the exercise of creative thought, without strife or rivalry. You can aim at nothing so great or noble, I repeat, as to become rich, and you must fix your attention upon your mental picture of riches, to the exclusion of all that may tend to dim or obscure the vision. You must learn to see the underlying truth in all things. You must see beneath all seemingly wrong conditions the great one life, ever moving forward towards fuller expression and more complete happiness. It is the truth that there is no such thing as poverty, that there is only wealth. Some people remain in poverty because they are ignorant of the fact that there is wealth for them, and these can best be taught by showing them the way to affluence in your own person and practice. Others are poor because, while they feel that there is a way out, they are too intellectually indolent to put forth the mental effort necessary to find that way and by travel it. Others still are poor because, while they have some notion of science, they have become so swamped and lost in the maze of metaphysical and occult theories that they do not know which road to take. They try a mixture of many systems and fail in all. For these, again, the very best thing to do is to show the right way in your own person and practice, 
an ounce of doing things is worth a pound of theorizing. The very best thing you can do for the whole world is to make the most of yourself. You can serve God and man in no more effective way than by getting rich. That is, if you get rich by the creative method and not by the competitive one. Another thing. We assert that this book gives in detail the principles of the science of getting rich. And if that is true, you do not need to read any other book upon the subject. This may sound narrow and egotistical, but consider... There is no more scientific method of computation in mathematics than by addition, subtraction, multiplication, 